<laughs> What's up, guys? Guess what? I don't have a movie review for you. But I'm going to talk some history talk. That's right. So in case you want to cut out to something else, like cat videos, you can do that now. I know history isn't the most uh, appeasing uh, topic, but uh, it's a passion of mine. Especially when it comes to violent history. I'm not saying all history has to be, you know, violent to enjoy it. That's just the, the part I like. And just how people figure stuff out. We'll never know what it's like to live in, uh, you know, Renaissance Italy. Or, you know, I don't know. You know, m <clears throat> medieval Rome and, and, you know, all these ancient places. We could, we could role play them or watch documentaries or dramas, but we'll never actually know. You know, what it's like it's why uh, one of the reasons why I'm fascinated um, you know and normally when I do these I talk about you know generals mercenaries uh, land battles I never really paid attention to see that much it's my fault I never really got my attention so I think it's overdue um, <clears throat> in fact my uh, topic of conversation are two uh, admirals one's kind of like a pirate but um still a you know a navy seafarer um <clears throat> and you know you never really know how important uh the navy is uh, when it comes to uh you know warfare um whether it be to back up uh, ground troops like if they have like you know like artillery on the ship like cannons or something um to drop off you know reinforcements or to do some you know scout work or reconnaissance you know, uh, the Navy, I think, plays a big game in winning a war. And there's a lot of sea battles during the Renaissance. And even, even before that, a lot of sea battles. I mean, Athens was a, was a sea, uh, seafaring type nation. Um, you know, it should be uh, definitely um, looked upon and studied. You know, just as much as, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, land warfare. Um so but actually, um, uh, two of the individuals I'm talking to came from really great, you know, seafaring nations, pretty much. So Italy was like, you know, kind of like chopped up in pieces, pretty much. Um, a little like a checkerboard. It wasn't unified till like way later. I'm talking like 1800s, 1900s. Um, so you, uh, the two, you know, biggest names on the map was the Republic of Venice and the Republic of Genoa. And both these individuals are from those respected cities and actually in competition with one another. Now, obviously, uh, years separate these two people, but I just think uh, I had to point that out. They were both, you know, uh, Navy men, uh, admirals in their own sense, and came from uh, competing Italian states, which I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. Um, all right, so I guess I'll start with uh, the Venetian here. Uh, it was actually a doge. His name is Pietro Masigo. Uh, there's an N in his name, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, silent. So I'm going to go with uh, Pietro Masigo. And he was actually a doge. So a doge is like a um, person in power, pretty much, who rules over that city. Um, I believe Genoa had doges, too. That's what they called them. And uh, it was a very, for a very short period of time, actually, 74, 76. Uh, I pulled up information about him here because uh, I don't trust my memory uh, I was going to recite this whole thing by memory but between you know like lack of sleep and just uh, you know the, the brain fog I didn't trust myself so I wanted to reference stuff so I could continue the conversation uh, so anyway uh, Pietro uh, was a doge you know a person in charge of the, of, uh, the Republic of Venice but for a very short time and I'm going to talk about his career as a navy guy so around this time, early 1400s, um, Venice uh, as a whole just wasn't doing well. You know, they were a superpower, then they weren't, then they were again. It was like real uh, back and forth, but they lost a lot of battles, and especially a lot of the provinces they had. Um, like a, they had a lot, a lot of uh, islands in the Aegean Sea that were lost to other republics of the Mediterranean, and especially... Uh, the Ottomans. The Ottomans were just kind of like kicking ass and taking names. And Venice, no matter how hard they tried to hang on to their property, it just kind of kept, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, Venice had some victories here and there, but it wasn't enough to stop the Ottoman machine. 
they would bulldoze through countries, half almost of Eastern Europe, the Baltics, what have you. You know, Ottomans were just the new kids on the block, and you know they were taking a bullshit. That's just how that's history. Um, it's not to say though Venice didn't put up a good fight, and this guy kind of resurrected that. So after all these battles and these losses, you get that one guy sometimes in history that pulls you out of the dirt and leads your people into victory. And in this case, it was this character right here. So basically, um, he destroyed a port town, um, Samara, I want to say. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, what I'll do is I'll just leave... Um, their, uh, their bios below so you can check it out for yourself and uh, if you're good at you know pronouncing these uh, states and stuff of different origin you know please correct me uh, so anyway that was like a you know a feather in his cap all right so he defeated this port town um, he placed a queen of Cyprus um, pretty much under his uh, domain so basically he went through these towns and these um port sounds uh, these uh, port towns that belong to the Ottomans and pretty much kind of uh, consolidated his power so you know he was a, a galley commander and an admiral you know he kind of kicked ass and took names you know and he won a lot of the times it would end either like in a draw or whatever the case be but he was uh, victorious a lot and enough to take this queen and pretty much kind of put her in protection pretty much now you have this this queen of the island of Cyprus. And by that, he kind of inherited the island, too. Uh, I'm not sure how long he lasted. Didn't really mention that. But, um, uh, you know, he, he moved on from that, obviously. There was other places. Um, Scutari, which is, I believe is another town that he um, uh, besieged. So pretty much kind of like ransacked it. Um, and he, you know, from what I gather, he did this well enough to gain the attention of the people because you just can't just be an elected leader like after like a journey. It's like, who you know, you have to kind of prove your worth to the people no matter what your status. I mean, you can be a great lawyer, but are you going to make a great leader? That wasn't always the case. Um, and in this case, though, it seems like the Venetians favored uh, admirals. Maybe it was because of their, you know you know, seafaring lifestyle. They relied a lot of, uh, on trade. That's what made, uh, you know, Venice uh, big to begin with and compete with other city-states in Italy. It was because of their trade. Sometimes they went behind people's backs and traded with their enemies. It, it was just life. It was capitalism in a full effect, and they made it work for themselves. But sometimes you have to consolidate power by any means. And sometimes when... Um, you know, talk, dialogue, and negotiations, and, and negotiations fall apart. You have guys like uh, Pietro here who steps in, not just with you know uh, the gift of speech, but the gift of power. And um, there's even um, people that were on the ship with him that commented uh, how well he did. You know, he fought uh, valiantly and led his men uh, into you know victory. Um, I'm trying to imagine what it must have been like being on a uh, like a galley, like a ship, under a Venetian command. When I mean, if you're going against the Ottomans, you know the odds are bleak. So you're either going to win or you're going to die, and maybe get out. You know, it's different when you're battling on sea because you're surrounded by ocean. If there's no land, you better be a really good swimmer. You might get captured by the enemy. You they were just you like you might die on the ship. You know, if it goes down. So, sea battles definitely have a certain merit to them, I think. Uh, that stands out. And, uh, fortunately for this guy, he led, he kind of put Venice kind of back on the map for the time being. Like I said, he was elected uh, uh, Doge for a short time. Because of all things, he didn't die on a ship. He died of a fever. Go figure, right? Apparently he um, contracted it when he was overseas fighting the Turks and... Uh, Got sick and died. But uh, he was enough that people wrote about him. Just like I'm today, I'm quoting, you know, what uh, you know, people that were on the ship with him said. So this wasn't just like a makeup job. You know, someone actually saw this guy in action and wrote a little bit down, you know, so I could share it with you guys. 
All right, so um, uh, that's uh, Pietro Monsigo. Now the next guy I told you is from Genoa. That's the same place uh, Christopher Columbus is. But don't worry, I'm not going to talk about him. I'm talking about this guy. This guy has a cool name. So it's Giovanni di Locavo, or John di Locavo. Already sounds like a mafia hitman. I love it. So he's a, uh, a Genoese pirate, public general, like I said. They're the competitors of Venice, also a seafaring place. And this guy, you know, obviously um, was active way before uh, Pietro. So we're talking like 13th century, you know, like 12 something, you know. Uh, and he was actually uh, in the service, so he's a pirate. So not necessarily a admiral per se. I mean, he controlled the ships at one point, but he was uh, employed by a Byzantine emperor, believe it or not, um, uh, Michael Papalogios. So you know, big shot in the time of Constantinople when Constantinople was still around. Um, and he was so good that uh, Michael, uh, the emperor, gave him uh, Anafi and Rhodes. Now those are two islands. Greek islands in the Aegean. Now those islands were always contested. I mean, not only were they really attractive, they're probably like, you know, they were a good uh, base of operations to be. So if you owned like these islands, not only do you have the resources, but you can launch other attacks into other, you know, structured places. So that's, that. you know, like if you ever read, uh, you know, um, history in this time, you'll notice the Aegean islands pop up a lot. It's not because they look good or the people, you know, that occupied them were there. It was just, they were useful locations. So, I mean, obviously, you know, there was, being a different time period, you had different enemies. Um, and in this case, it was the Latins, believe it or not. So now this is going to sound very confusing because you think, you know, normally people of the same religion, the same sides, right? It's not quite the case. So the Latins were like Catholics, and the Greeks um, were like Orthodox, and there was like this big um, separation of churches, whatever. So, you know, layman terms, they just didn't like each other, okay? And the Latins were able to secure some of these islands. But every now and then, you have that, like I said, that one person in history just says, hmm, I have the skills that the other guy might need. And so you kind of like rent yourself out. In this case, this uh, John de Lo Calvo guy was a mercenary in a sense. He was a pirate, so you know, a mercenary on sea. So basically, um, his deal is he would uh, hunt. You know, he's a pirate, so he would hunt down other ships. Um, I guess under whoever he was serving at the time, um, throughout the Mediterranean, Aegean Islands, and all the way up to the about uh, Al Albanian coast. So the, the guy did some traveling. He wasn't just no. Um, you know, nobody pretty much. And he was good enough that uh, the Byzantine Emperor uh, was impressed by his skills, you know, because I, I suspect that he would win these islands over, either by force or by convincing, you know, the lords to submit to him. He would give it to the Emperor. So it was like a gift, like, here, here's your island back, bud. And obviously the reward was either money, or in this case, he made him in charge of the... Um, the Byzantine Navy. Uh, you know, it's uh, like a duke, pretty much. Think of it that way. Uh, they call it a magus uh, dux. Probably saying that wrong. A dukes. D-O-U-X. A duke. So basically he's in charge of something, pretty much. And in this case, he was in charge of probably, you know, the uh, the Navy at the time. You know, there, there was a... a Another guy who had this rank too, who was actually another Italian, um, who was working for the Byzantines. So, and he kind of did the same thing. So this guy actually, you know, uh, John wasn't necessarily born um, in Italy. He was obviously he was Italian, but like I said, he, you know, Italians were spread out all over the place in the Aegean. So that you wouldn't be surprised to have like colonies of Italians on these different Greek islands. So this is where this guy came from. Um, uh, Anaf <clears throat> and, uh, the island of Anafi, I think that's how you pronounce it, A-N-A-F-I, and so, um, he actually won that back, so that's kind of cool, imagine losing your, uh, your home, for whatever reason, 
and then fighting for it and you get it back. You know, maybe you lost a bet and then you try again and you win that bet. So whatever you lost the first time is now yours again. So it must have been a great kind of feeling, you know, especially if it's, you're, it's tied to your family. Like I said, this guy impressed the emperor so much, which is a hard thing to do. I mean, it's enough to impress the people or, I don't know, a general or your crew, which is all important, but to impress someone who was in charge of entire provinces, you know, and then get elected to be in charge of a navy, you know, letting, I mean, to be fair, the Ottomans did this too. The Ottomans would pick like, really like scurvy pirates to be in charge of their navy, but who else would know the waters, right? Then, you know, you know, the pirates of the Aegean in this case, you know, they had pirates of the Caribbean, pirates of the Aegean, you know, they just kind of knew the water. They knew the ins and outs, they know what ports to avoid, uh, who was friend, who was foe, and how to buy yourself out of that situation. The pirate life is, I should do a video on that because that's an interesting lifestyle. I've read a book on uh, pirates from literally all over, from the Americas to, you know, Europe to the ancient times, you know. Uh, it was a trade that, you know, died out. I mean, it, it did, but then it picked up again. You Every now and then you hear of, you know, Somali pirates taking some big... Um, you know, not a cruise ship, but like a, like a cargo ship. And you're wondering, how could like five little people on a raft take a ship, take a ship that big? Well, if you got guns, it makes a hell of a difference. And in this case, when you're in, in, intimidating, when you're a pirate intimidating a Navy vessel or a cargo ship, I mean, you're, you're taking a chance. It may or may not be armed, but if it's a regular, you know, just some kind of a ship having cargo, like food or what, what have you, it might not be armed. I mean, I might have an escort, but, you know, being so um, uh, cavalier on the water and knowing the ins and outs, you could ambush a sh ship as soon as it crosses an island, and boom, there you go. And I believe this is what this, the skills that this guy had. So, um, <clears throat> like I said, it didn't take long for him to, um, you know, win back a series of islands, get favor of the emperor, and, and doing all these things, and in this kind of time period, but with, especially with the Byzantines, where they just got Byzantium back from, like, you know, the uh, the Latins, per se. We're, like, we're not even talking about, like, you know, fighting the Ottomans at, at this point. You know, yeah, they're there. There's a lot of enemies of the Byzantines, but the Latins were kind of like a thorn on the side. Because one day they're your friend, and one day they're not. So the Byzantines had to really pick and choose... You know their fight but obviously you could say they didn't care where you where you came from pretty much if you were fighting for their cause and you did really good you got rewarded you could have been anybody any you could have been from france germany in this case italy the byzantines if they thought you fought well you were recruited simple as that and the perks from that having an empire back you sky's the limit so um yeah um this guy, he uh, he fought hard, and he kind of reaped the benefits. It doesn't really mention um, when he died. I'm sure when he, you know, he probably had all, he probably retired actually first, because it doesn't really say he died of like fever or disease. Which usually like the, it's either like a fever takes you out, some weird disease, you get stabbed in the back, or let's see what else, or you die in battle. Those were like the main causes of death, you know, during like, you know, this era. And probably after that too. But um, I'm not seeing a list it, so I'm going to assume that he did all he could do at a, at a, you know, old age probably and then just retire and probably, you know, die in bed maybe. He probably, maybe he's one of the guys that actually died peacefully. Because, you know, living, you know, um, uh, living was not easy uh, dying was easy but uh, living in this time period was not unless we were well off of course and this guy I think that's ultimately what probably would happen these are all guesses by the way I'm just talking about his career uh, he was good at what he did but after that it's uh, drawing a blank here you know obviously no one really followed him or maybe they did and the books didn't make it 
whatever they call it, it's not listed uh, what happened to him after he, you know, was awarded these islands. Um, now, the other guy I mentioned, the Venetian, obviously, he had people there that admired him because he became a, a doge, obviously, so people wrote about him. That you just get, once you become like a, like a governor of something, you know, you that's how that works. And that wasn't really the case in the, the Byzantines. It was, you know, the, the emperors had bios, the, um, the patriarchs, the queens, the princes, um, sometimes the generals, sometimes the military personnel, but it wouldn't be as extent as like, you know, the families, the, the royal families pretty much. So this guy got a nice coverage. You know, I was able to give you all that information about him pretty much. Uh, you know, he, he, he came from a, um, an Italian family from a Greek island. Uh, he fought on the side of the Byzantines. He won back the islands. He gave them as presents, and in return, he became a uh, an admiral, uh, per se. He was in charge, you know. Yeah, you know, obviously the rank had shifted a lot, you know. There would be people before him and people after him that will hold his title. But um, uh, I just thought that was kind of interesting, and um, you know, I mean, you know, maybe people did. You know, or, you know, did, like, biographies on them. I don't know. I, you know, like I said, I'm not going to go digging around. I was trying to find something new to talk about. Or someone who hasn't been mentioned is rough. This isn't easy. You know, this is why I pulled up this stuff, just to, you know, mention it to you guys. Um, but, yeah, uh, I think it was interesting. Uh, both these gentlemen were admirals. You know, they fought on the sea. And it's a different kind of lifestyle. And it's a different kind of warfare as opposed to being on land or on horseback. You're in the middle of the ocean. You don't have that many rations. It's not like, you know, you could plant stuff on the deck of your ship. Maybe you can. I heard some stories like that, but it was rough. Being on a ship alone back in the day. Think of the hygiene problems, you know? So that, for these guys to achieve the goals that they did, and they're just one of, you know, millions that were uh, great Navy seafaring types. Uh, there's countless explorers that did wonder work that have entire books about them. These guys are just a fraction of that. But I just thought it was two interesting uh, Italians in two different periods of time where um, you would not necessarily uh, hear about this, like in uh, you know your history class, say, or on the Discovery Channel or History Channel. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. And uh, <clears throat> yeah. I just thought it was interesting. A uh, little change of pace for me. Like I said, I normally don't talk about Navy stuff. And I just want to share it with you. So I hope you learned something, guys. All right. Well, that's all I got to say. Um, I don't know. I might do another history one or a movie review. It depends how I feel. But uh, I felt pretty good doing this. It was cool. I normally don't get to, you know, blab about this kind of stuff that much. And uh, But when I do, I can go on and on. Really. I can make an hour-long video if I wanted to. All right, uh, enough about that. So, um, yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys very soon. Maybe another history subject, maybe a movie review, not sure. Um, but, yeah, anyway, uh, look, thanks for taking the time to actually watch any bit of this. I do this mostly for you guys, partly for me, but mostly for you guys. So uh, that's all i got to say. Uh, thanks for watching. All right, see you guys soon. Peace.